Welcome. Good morning to those that are watching from home. Uh, a lot of us are watching from home this morning. Appreciate you that have come out and braved the icy weather. And uh, we're going to begin now with our song service. My Lord has garments so wondrous fine And mirth their texture fills Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come here today as your children on the first day of the week to worship you, to give you thanks. Father, we're 
grateful for everything that you do for us, Father. You keep us safe. You keep us in the word. Father, we're most especially grateful for your son's perfect sacrifice on our behalf so that we could join you as your children in heaven. Father, we pray for our elders and our volunteers as we all continue to do your word here in the community. Father, we pray that you continue to give us the strength and energy we need to, to share your truth in our community and convert more souls unto you, Father. Father, we pray for all those on our prayer list. We have many in the body who are suffering with COVID and other issues, other loved ones. Father, we pray for that you continue to guide their caregivers and their healthcare professionals. Father, we pray that you return them unto us according to your will, Father. Dear Lord, we pray for all those around the world that are fighting for our freedom to gather here and praise and honor you, Father. We pray that you bring them home to their families according to your will. Father, we also pray that all the leaders around the world look to you for wisdom and guidance. Father, we, we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Supper, I have this reading to share with you. It's from Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 26. For Jesus says to the Lord's Supper with his disciples. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for many for remission of sins. But I say to you, when I drink of this fruit of the vine, from now on until that day when I drink anew of you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The hymn Jesus and his disciples sung as they walked to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives was Psalms 115 through 118, written, written hundreds of years earlier. These psalms were sung at the end of every Passover. Verses 22 to 24 of Psalms 118 would have had a special meaning to Jesus as he sang them, knowing these prophetic words would soon be fulfilled with his death, burial, and resurrection. It reads as follows. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. 
we rejoice and be glad in it. What is a cornerstone? It is the sto first stone set in the construction of a mystery foundation. As the first stone laid, it becomes a reference point for all other stones laid subsequent to it. As we take the Lord's Supper, let us remember Jesus fulfilled this prophecy to become the chief cornerstone of God's plan for mankind's salvation. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for your Son, Jesus Christ. As we take of this bread, Father, help us to understand his love and your love for us, Father, that he was willing to die on the cross for our sins, Lord. Father, we give thanks to you for this bread. For his name we pray. Amen. continuing in prayer. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents your son's shed blood. Father, realize it's his blood that cleanses us, Father, and makes us acceptable in your sight. And Father, also seals the promise that you've made with, with us and for all those obedient to the gospel, that one day, Father, we're faithful that we'll spend an eternity in heaven with you. Father, if you bless us and bless us the cup as we take of it. First, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Concludes the Lord's Supper at this time for convenience sake. Um, we'll give thanks for the offering and for anyone who wishes to uh, give. There's a, a box in the back on the table. Please uh, let us pray. Father, this time I'm coming for you, giving you thanks for all the many blessings you've stored from us, Father. It was all for your Son, Jesus. Father, help us to be towards all the many blessings you've stored from us. Father, remember, give thanks to you for our jobs, our family, for all the things that we, you provide for us, Lord. For his name we pray. Amen. fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Thank you, Brother Danny, for the reading of God's word. We say once again welcome and 
Good morning to everyone. If you're visiting with us, we appreciate your presence and we pray that you will be blessed by your attendance this morning. For those of you who are joining us online, we appreciate you and uh, your time here with us as well. So as most of you all know, um, we have been conducting a study in the life of Christ. Last uh, couple weeks ago, Brother Wally shared a lesson with us. And uh, this morning, I want to share a lesson with you on that as well. And um, this morning, I will get back to our initial slide here. Um, this morning, we are going to examine the concept of the fullness of time. So today's topic is God's perfect timing. We're going to take a look at what the world was like when Jesus came and was made flesh and dwelt among us. I believe this topic is crucial to our understanding of the gospel message. So as we begin, the first thing that we have to acknowledge is God is perfect. God is perfect. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4, Moses said, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. And several hundred years later, David writes in Psalm chapter 19, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Hence, it only follows then that if the work of God is perfect, and His law is perfect, and He is perfect, it certainly should not surprise us in any way that His timing is perfect as well. So you see, the coming of the Messiah was planned from before He created the world. And we know that the prophets foretold of Christ's coming. And likewise, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, Paul, the apostle, says, He was made a minister so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to His saints. And then later, writing to the letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 1, Paul says, An administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. So, I want to explore for a while this concept of the fullness of time, and then we will look at the implications of the fullness of time. First of all, the concept of the fullness of time. You see, this concept underlies several different expressions in the New Testament. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, as Jesus was beginning His earthly ministry, He said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. And in Matthew chapter 26, in the 18th verse, as Christ approached His time of His redemptive death, Jesus said, My time is near. Paul, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, said that Christ gave Himself a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Paul also said that God, who cannot lie, promised before times eternal, but in His own seasons manifested His Word in the message, that coming from Titus chapter 1. So you see, the concept is really the same, regardless of which Greek word is used for time. Now in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, as Brother Danny read, the word that is used there is chronos, which is typically expressing the idea of time as chronological. But there's also another word called karios, a word which is used to illustrate the opportune or the proper time. So the idea here is that God is a God of history. He works all things together in the macrocosm of the course of all human events according to His eternal purpose. 
And so while we may be fixated on the physical world in which we live, God transcends the physical. God is atemporal. That is just a fancy word which simply means he is not bound by time as we are. And so having considered the idea of the fullness time, let us now consider the implications of that idea. First, at just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, and while his birth presents a great mystery to us in that he was born to the Virgin Mary, the Bible also tells us that his birth was part of God's plan. Jesus was born the Son of Man. In fact, he referred to himself as such. But he was also God, and he was the Son of God. In other words, Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. And this truth we must accept by faith. And yet there are those in this world who refuse to accept this truth. And as John tells us in 1 John chapter 4 and in 2 John verse 7, the rejection of Jesus as the incarnate Son of God evidences the presence of of a massive opposition to him. Notice what John says in 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. And later in 2 John he repeats and goes on to say, For many deceivers are entered into this world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. And so while we may never be able to fully understand the mystery of Jesus' birth, Jesus' virgin birth, if we profess to believe in the testimony of the apostles and the prophets as witness in the Bible, we must accept it by faith. Secondly, at just the right time, God sent his son born under the law. We were talking about this earlier in the morning with Brother Wally's Sunday school lesson. You see, Jesus was born when the Old Testament was still the law of the Jewish people. And he was part of a family who lived under the law. The Apostle Luke records in the second chapter of his gospel that he was circumcised on the eighth day, he being Jesus, and presented at the temple fulfilling the law. He goes on to say that when he, that is Jesus, was 12 years old and stayed behind in the temple, after he explained that he had to be in my father's house. And of course he went home with Mary and Joseph and continued in subjugation to them, as Luke tells us in Luke chapter 2 verse 51. And in this way he fulfilled the fifth commandment, which is to honor your father and your mother. But you see, the real significance of Jesus being born under the law is that, as we heard Brother Danny read from Galatians, he was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. And we know that to redeem means to buy back. And this word is often used when referred to buying the freedom of slaves in times past. And I think Paul must have had this in mind primarily when he thought of the Jewish Christians who had been liberated from the curse of the law, as it says. And of course, in Galatians chapter 3, we read, They that had once been under law and its curse, but Jesus had set them free. Amen. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, we hear the apostle address the redemption of the Gentiles saying, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from an empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And I like the way that it says there that you were redeemed from that empty way of life. Another version of the Bible calls it their futile way of life. And you know that well describes our condition, our state, without the redemption of our Christ. And so I want to sum things up again by saying that God's timing was perfect in sending His Son. In fact, many scholars of the Bible point to three key factors that reinforce this notion that the timing and the location of Jesus' arrival was perfect. First, they note that there was a universal language, that is, the Greek language that all people spoke. Secondly, they note that at this time there was what was called the Pax Romana, which means the Roman peace. There was peace widely throughout the Roman Empire. And then thirdly, there was an enormous building of massive networks of roads and infrastructure that permitted an empire-wide transportation and communication that allowed the gospel of Christ to be spread throughout the known world. You see, all of these things help facilitate the spreading of the gospel message. So yes, God's timing in sending His Son was perfect. But you know, that's not all. God's timing is also perfect today. And while we may never understand His timing today in that it seems sometimes that He takes a long time to answer our prayers, takes a long time for us to come to realization of what our purposes in our lives may be and so forth. Yet we can affirm that God's timing today is in fact perfect. And we must just accept by faith that He does know what He is doing and that He will work in our lives in His perfect way. Several weeks ago, Brother Dale Weisenbach was preaching and he brought up um, in his lesson uh, a discussion talking about the Creator and the Cosmos, which is a book written by Dr. Hugh Ross. And he piqued my interest and I went out and I, I got the book and started to read it. And it was an astounding book that I would highly um, recommend to you if you ever uh, get a chance to read it. And in this book, The Creator and the Cosmos, the author cites a lot of examples of God's perfect timing. And in fact, uh, in the book, I will be honest with you, it's written by a quantum physicist, so it's pretty deep reading. Um, but in the book, the author lists more than 150 specific things that illustrate the fine-tuning of the universe. That is God's perfect timing. And it spans everything from the very smallest particles on Earth to the alignment of the planets to the absolutely perfect synchronization that takes place throughout all of the universe that makes life, particularly human life, possible here on this planet, which is, as the book shows, completely unique in all of our known universe. And so as we think about that particular aspect of the physical world, we know that God the Creator spun these universes into existence. And yet, this is the same God who, who, who loves us. The same God who sent His Son to die for us, that we may have salvation and live with Him forever in eternity. And it's hard to contemplate that and think about that without realizing that yes, a God who would do that, who has the ability to make sure that every single iota of this universe is in perfect harmony, is the same God who wants to have a relationship with us. This is the same God who sent His Son to die for us. The same God who yearns for us to accept His words, His commandments, and return to Him. I love that old hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. And it's one of the most famous hymns in church history, and even in American history. In fact, this hymn is also famous for being a source of encouragement and serenity for Civil War soldiers many, many years ago. 
And I'm sure you probably well remember the second and third verses which say, May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. As thou hast died for me, oh, may my love to thee pure, warm, and changeless be a living fire. When life's dark maze I tread, and grief around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. And so this morning as we reflect upon God's word in this simple message, I pray that you will be strengthened and encouraged by knowing that God is in control. And his timing has perfect, his timing is perfect and has always been so, and it will always be so. And this morning, your faith should be strengthened knowing that God loves you and he desires for you to be part of his family. And so this morning, we'd invite you to please come forward if you have any need at all, as together we stand and sing the song of encouragement that Brother Wally has chosen for us. Sinners, Jesus will receive Salvation's word of grace to all who every pathway lead, all anger, all who fall, the seal of the Lord, thy Lord again, Christ receive us sinful men. some notes. Uh, we have one that's come forward today that wants to give her life to Christ, and her name is Sherry. And uh, I wanted to make a few comments. We, we, Patty and Sherry have talked. Sherry is uh, my daughter's mother-in-law, and uh, we share the same grandchildren, and when they call her Grandma Sherry, it confuses me because I think her only grandparent is... Patty, but <laughs> they are so blessed to have grandparents, and Ron is here, and their daughter, uh, Ronnie's here too, to witness this, and there are many of you that are witnessing from home, and I wanted to, I asked her to be brave and come forward if she could, so the congregation can rejoice in this beautiful event. Sherry and I have been talking, though, and, uh, you know, I said, sometimes God knocks on our hearts, and that's what she was telling me. Sherry is a believer, but she wasn't sure that she's obeyed all the steps that God has asked us biblically. And God said through Jesus, ask and you will receive, knock and you shall find, and the door will be open to you. In 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter says also, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men might count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us all, not that any would, should perish, but all should come to repentance. And we can have a belief outside, or we can believe in God, but still be outside his will. And we talked about that in the first hour, and share even the devil believes, but he trembles because he won't obey. And in James chapter 2, 19, James says, Thou believest there is one God, 
thou doest well, the devil also believes and trembles. The Jews believed, but they were outside the will of God. And we look at that the first hour. God's judgment came down upon the Jews because they wouldn't obey God in the way they worshipped him. And Patty and Sherry were talking about baptism and how important it was. And I wanted to share this with you because we just heard a beautiful lesson from Mark. Don't leave. I've got to find out how you access the site. I can't get in. And also, you'd be prepared to sing another song. Um, but we were talking about the importance of a watery baptism and how the Bible illustrates baptism's total immersion. Sherry called Patty and said, did you leave this on my doorstep? The very next day of the discussion, we're talking about the timing of God and how God's per timing is perfect. She received this on her doorstep. There's somebody at the door. And it's from another church here. And I'm going to call the pastor the Truth Tabernacle Church. And they left her this uh, information on baptism. The very next day, and she said to Patty, did you leave that on my doorstep? Now, is that coincidence or what? I don't think so. God is knocking on your heart, and it uh, makes my heart tremble. But Peter didn't say to know God is just to somehow pray a prayer, and you'll accept, be accepted into uh, his good gracious graces. Peter said in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 he said Peter said come repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the Holy Ghost and that's what I talked to Sherry about to become a member of the Lord's church is one where you totally obey his will, repent, and be baptized for the remission of sins. And at 241 of Acts, they gladly received this word and were baptized the same day. They were added unto the church about 3,000 souls. So what we're about to do here is nothing but the power of God. You're not doing anything, and I'm only a facilitator. It's the power of God who adds you to the church. And que the question Jesus asked Peter is, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh, flesh and blood has not received this, but it came from my Father in heaven. And that's some of the steps I'm going to ask you to repeat in just a second. Sherry, I know you believe. We've talked, we studied for an hour or so together a few weeks ago. I know you understand what belief is. But we want to also obey the gospel because in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 8, the Lord has promised that He'll come back with vengeance and He will judge those who know not God and do not obey the gospel. And that's what we're asking Sherry to help us do today is obey the gospel. And the gospels believe, repent, confess that Jesus is your Savior, be baptized, and then live faithfully. Sherry, would you mind coming up here with me? And again, I appreciate your, your brave soul. <clears throat> And I want to ask you again this question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes, I do. Okay. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess them before God in heaven. And what we are going to do today is immerse you in water. But God asks you to live faithfully, too. In Romans chapter 10, 17, he says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. In Revelation 2.10, Jesus says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. And we talked about this. The devil's ready to cast many stumbling blocks before you. But we ask you this day, as, as you confess what you've done, I know you believe, and we're going to baptize you. 
in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then God asks you to live faithfully from this point on. Are you ready to do that? Yes, I am. Okay. We're going to do a baptism now and the waters are cold. Uh, we're working on getting the system fixed, but it's not. So what I'm going to do is Patty's going to help you get ready. Okay. Once we go into the water, I'm going to baptize you really quick so it's not too, okay. <laughs> not too disturbing. <laughs> Okay, good morning again. Uh, while they are preparing, let's uh, sing a couple of songs. Uh, number 620 in our hymn book. Number 620 in the hymn book. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem.
praise your name and thank you for this great blessing of this day, this first day you've given to us, that the body of Christ might come together. This day, Heavenly Father, we know that the angels rejoice because one has come that was lost. And Heavenly Father, we praise your name for this. But we rejoice with you, with each other, and we join with the new sister in Christ. Be with us, Heavenly Father, and all those we have on our prayer list, those we pray with, Heavenly Father, those who are ill, those who are going through surgeries and recovering. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you grant them healing. And Heavenly Father, be thy will that they come and join us again the next appointed time. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>